today is Zalm and Harav Shnei Zalm Lopkovsky. I'm carrying on a long tradition here of speaking at these kids of Torah for many, many years. And uh, I normally, can you hear me on that? Is it all right? I normally read out of my uh, encounters with the Rebbe, except, and I have prepared something from this year, but on second courts, I've decided to read what I wrote 20 years ago. And that will give you some idea of what happened in those far off days. What I want, before I start, I want to impress upon everybody that the Rebbe loves to have happy faces around him. He likes people to be frailer and he wants people to be happy. And then everybody will be happy too. Now then, I have been visiting the Rebbe in Brooklyn for 10 years before I decided to write my encounter with the Rebbe Schlitter. And this is what I wrote in that first instalment. This year, we arrived at 7th century from England at about 7 o'clock in the evening. Rabbi Chadikov informed me that the Rebbe would be addressing the annual Nisei Chabad conference in about half an hour's time in the large hall, after which it was proposed that the women and girls from out of town only would form a line past the Rebbe, who was sitting alone at the table on the platform, flanked by Rabbi Khadakov and Rabbi Groner. They would be allowed just a couple of moments to speak to the Rebbe. Rabbi Khadakov suggested that after the final past of women and girls are finished, we could then tag along and say Salam Aleichem to the Rebbe. We rushed like mad to get to the hall before eight o'clock. There were about 500 women and girls present and all anxious to speak to the Rebbe. So, although only the out of town ladies were supposed to file past, all the 500 insisted upon joining the queue. Instead of waiting an hour for our turn, we waited seven hours until three o'clock in the morning. We enjoyed an unforgettable experience. We were the last in the line. There were now three girls ahead of us. Each would hand to the Rebbe a letter, four or five pages, which took the Rebbe four or five minutes to read. Then without hesitation, he replied to the girl, you may continue to do this or to do that. Stay at college, or Rabbi Kharakov will loan you $250 to finish the course. Pay back when you're able. Go to camp this year. Take this group, that course. She was tremendously pleased and uplifted. And when she moved away. The girl immediately before burst into tears with joy, she said, on going to see the Rebbe for the very first time. Then it was our turn. Why did you, why did you not come the day before Shabbos and have another for Brengen, he said. I told Beryl Footman, in those days we arranged the charter ourselves. We didn't just get to plane. We raised for 180 or 20 people and we brought the plane at our convenience. So I told Beryl Foots of us that the Rebbe had made a joke about coming for Shabbat Mubarakim. He said that the Rebbe does not make jokes and he is now preparing for next year's flight to arrive in time for Shabbat Mubarakim. The Rebbe asked me whether we for bring in Manchester. Yes, every Shabbat Mubarakim, I said. Oh, you will have to change your name to Kafar Chabad. We were staying at the flats above the, above the cola, adjoining the back of 770 in Union Street. This belonged to the Rebbe. Where are you staying, he asked us. Union Street. Ah, good. Unity. Shalom. Oh, I'm real crossy now, and I'm well and truly at home at 770, where people trample on my feet with relish, push me with the hard elbows, and mind you, I'm becoming quite an expert myself at this. And I knew all this is not the game. 
Now then, to my eternal surprise and astonishment, but also gratification, the Rebbe has continued to bestow upon me much honor. Once I was tempted to ask him why he teaches me so remarkably well, when in fact I had done nothing, nothing very much to merit such favors. The Rebbe replied that it was not for the work which I had done, but for what I was going to do. Many years later, I asked the Rebbe again why I was so favored and recalled what he had said to me on the previous occasion. That is, it was for the work I was going to do and not for what I had done. The Rebbe replied and said, the same applies today. Once more, I was invited to join the Rebbe for Yom Tovim meals, together with about a dozen or so other men. Obviously, this was a very, a very great honor, enjoyable, dignified, but oh, so tense. After all, we were dining with our own royalty. The guests assembled in the large dining room upstairs on the first floor of 770. This was the residence of the previous Rebbe, Dr. Rebbe and his Rebbeson was our hostess. But of course, we did not realize this until many years afterwards. Because the previous Rebbeson, when she passed away, the Rebbe Slitik discontinued these meals at his mother-in-law's home, although the Rebbeson herself never actually attended the meals. During all these years, the Rebbe had given up the comfort and pleasure of his very own yacht of table for the sake of Kibberdame, of honoring his own Rebbeson's mother. At the time, we were puzzled and surprised that the Rebbe did not sit at the head of the table. After all, he was our king. And Rabbi Shemtov adamantly declined to attend these meals. He could not bear to see the Rebbe take a back seat. Yet, it made sense, although, as I have already stated, we did not realize it at that time. We sat around a large rectangular table. There were normally six seats on either side with two chairs at the bottom end. Each place was set with a silver becher for kiddish and two loaves of bread. The table itself was laid with an immaculate snow white linen cloth and the finest cutlery, crockery and glassware were provided. Wine, soda and other drinks were at hand for when required. The top, the head of the table, was set exactly the same as all the other places, but the chair was to remain unoccupied. This was the previous Rebbe's tish, and the chair was his too. It was a symbolic gesture. Therefore, the Rebbe, who was the youngest son-in-law, sat on the left-hand side, whilst Rabbi Shmugarari the Nishag sat on the right. Next to him was Rabbi Simpson, and my seat was always the same next to Rabbi Simpson, but almost opposite to the Rebbe. On the first day of Shavuos, before luncheon, we partook of coffee and cake, not cheese, in the adjoining room. The Rebbe was not present on these occasions, but the previous Rebbeson, accompanied by her lady-in-waiting, welcomed her guests and presided over the gathering. She had a warm and gracious smile for everyone, a typical charming Queen Mother. Continue, to continue with the story, the Rebbe made kiddies quietly, whilst his Rebbeson listened at the door, which is slightly ajar. We all followed suit, each one in a subdued voice. Then we all watched. The Rebbe is served first, of course, but he will not commence eating until after everyone is seated and served, even the boys who are acting as waiters. I once asked a boy to exchange the tongue I was given for chicken, and it took seven minutes. It seemed like seven hours, all waiting for me to be served. The Rebbe eats very slowly indeed, and sees to it that he finishes 
that cause last. No one would eat after the Rebbe has put down his cutlery. Therefore, he was always watching and ensuring that all have eaten before he lays down his knife and fork. There is no talking or even whispering during the actual courses, which consists of the usual lots of dishes, fish, soup, chicken or meat, fruit, then drinks. At the Achilles, subsequently to the first meal, I told the Rebbe that I was very disappointed at the atmosphere of the dinner. So quiet, so still and so tense. I said, he's... I, oh, I said, I said. And I told him, you should tell the Chassidim to make the Rebbe freilich. The Rebbe agreed and said, yes, you must tell the Chassidim to make the Rebbe freilich. So, I now feel a special responsibility for trying, in between the course, to unravel the proceedings, singing the gunim and telling a joke or two, all with the Rebbe's permission, of course. It is a bit embarrassing to have to force oneself to break the uncanny silence. Although the Rebbe speaks to, to me normally in perfect Yiddish, he insists that I speak in Yiddish, so that all would understand. I'm always given the honor of benching at one of the four meals. This means that I have to drink the whole bucket of wine and make a bracha krona, whilst everyone remains seated and quiet. Not, not like I have today at some of these uh, <laughs> dinners we go to. At the meals this year, thank God, the atmosphere was happy, like a family party. Then be asked me to sing a nigan after the first course on the first night of Yontov. I did so, but when the Rebbe asked me to sing another one, I had to be diplomatic. The fetter Hendel normally did the Nigunim, and I did not want to hurt his feelings. The previous year, the Rebbe had asked him to sing a tune, which he did, Allah has, but without the words. The Rebbe said, no words, give him a siddha. So the fetter Hendel started again, and once more again, he sang without the words, although he had the siddha in his hands. We discussed Manchester problems, and I recounted what I had said to Rabbi Shai, who asked me what was the problem about putting up a building. All one needed was money, he said. Oh, said I, anybody could put up a building with money. The, clever, the cleverness was to do it without money. So, how did you manage? Asked the Rabbi Rishag. I answered with the Rebbe's bracha. All were delighted with this answer because he pointed out to the Rabbi Rishag that one had to do what the Rebbe instructed and it would be crowned with success. Rabbi Rishag then pointed out that from searching so for him we can learn that we need not have a Fabrengen on Shavuos. Good, said the Rebbe, then we will have a rest. Oh no, says I, will not let you off. This caused much laughter, and Rabbi Rashag said, you must come more often. The Rebbe intervened and said, everyone has his zaman for coming. As I, Dava, not a son of the Ahmed, and for so many years, so I cannot cover that time. The Rebbe then paid me some very nice compliments. On the first day of Yom Tov, <coughs> I was surprised that Haderes Vermuna was not sung. I therefore mentioned it to the Rebbe that in Manchester we always sang this nigun at Shachris. Every Shabbos, asked the Rebbe. Oh no, I replied, only on Yontov. Why not every Shabbos? Oh dear, I said. If, if he would took an extra, if he'd sang Haderes Vermuna on Shabbos and took an extra five minutes, we would be, end up by having no members. Next day we did sing this during Shachris, the first time for a few years. At the next meal I thanked the Rebbe, who said I should have mentioned it before, and we would have sung it the first day as well. And I would receive commission for this, and this would come in useful as a bargaining counter for an extra for brain. And this is what happened those years. After Tikkun Shavuos, Three o'clock in the morning, the first night of Shavuos, the Rebbe said the Mimer, 
45 minutes deep and penetrating talk are considered. After the Rebbe had left at quarter to four in the morning, Rabbi Khan then repeated the same manner. It was uncanny, like a human tape recorder. And then the Rebbe gave some talk uh, about um, Terry, which I'll not tell you about. Then during this death of Rengen, the Rebbe asked me why I was unemployed. I had not said the Chaim for quite a while. Once the Rebbe handed me a large plate full of cake and a bottle of wine. What should I do with these, I asked. You'll soon see, said the Rebbe. I was practic practically mobbed and I just managed to salvage a few pieces of cake for my wife. This for bringing took seven and a half hours and ended at half past three in the morning when the Rebbe gave out kosher broche and this took another hour or more. For, now, during this for bringing we had visits from Mayor Lindsay who was seeking pre-election as Mayor of New York and also some of the other candidates. The next day we have the usual Kiddush Torah, which we're having now, and uh, it took from four o'clock till half past ten at night, when the Russian Yeshivas and other prominent speakers of Jesters and Gate were pulling. Now, I was asked to speak, which I did for ten minutes, which is every children, and it recalled the boys who used to learn at 770 when the Rebbe had only the small upstairs bits of medrash. And I told them the motto, people who lived at the source of a river did not realize the blessings and benefits which the river is giving during the thousands of miles of its flow to the sea. Some same thing with the Rebbe. Here in Brooklyn, the boys did not realize that thousands of miles away, the river was flowing stronger and larger than ever, bringing upon so many thousands of people and families untold blessings. Is it lovely? Okay. Thank you very much. It's for time now. Ich habe mich nicht